were originally mastered. They were most of these tracks were mastered for uh, LP versions. So the original <laughs> versions are masters made for LPs for analog LPs, which are totally different from what you would make if you were making CDs, which is a lot what a lot of people buy or cassettes even. And most people buy either in, in those two things. I mean, I think this is available in some places on LP. But. So the the whole point of the way it was originally mastered is kind of lost. People people have these very purist ideas and they want to hear something that was once they bought or they heard. They did a lot of searching about old tape rooms and boxes and stuff, trying to, you know, I know a lot of research went into it and they, they found some intro, you know, the, the originals, a lot of them. And it, and for me, it's interesting to hear the stuff coming back, you know, and, uh, you know, well, you mixed it that way then, and it, it now, you know, you, you got a second chance to play with it, you know, and it's that interesting, you know. Uh, and some good songs on there, not bad. Some of them. There's some surprises on there, like Wild Horses and things, which I think is good to mix with, you know, stuff through the years, like Miss You and um, Waiting on a Friend and even up to rock and a hard place. Um, it sounds quite an interesting um, theory to have all these songs put together. Obviously the songwriting thing has changed from the beginning. Um, when we just used to write the first thing that comes into your head and so on. But uh, I think that, um, this, I mean, I think that, uh, both in the earlier and later songs, they, they all, there's all different ways of writing songs. I mean, you can sit down and write a real, um, uh, a song that just starts and two people are just sitting there playing it and it's a real, kind of, both people contributing to lyrics and melody and arrangements and so on. Or you can just bring a song completely finished into it, which, there's, on this compilation, there's a lot of that. Writing songs hadn't occurred to us until uh, our first album came out, and then, so, well, you know, we need, that was the best of your material that you play, you know, and we're going to need some new stuff. Now, either, either you go out and look for songwriters and look for songs, or how much simpler, as Andrew Oldham said, if we could write our own. For a while, we wrote kind of Beatles kind of songs and then we wrote ballads and we found it very hard to write rock songs um and it took a while to get that we were still doing cover versions and eventually we graduated to writing rock songs john and paul were uh, because they were doing it already they're just a few months in front of us you know that what a self-contained unit that would be fantastic and he says well Mick and keith go and write a song and we look at each other and He's nuts, you know, he's, uh, that's another job, you know, I mean, I've never, never thought about doing that ever. So he locked us in the kitchen and we came out with his tears go by and in six weeks it was in the top ten with Marianne Faithful. You know, mm, it can be done, you know. No one had ever written songs that I would recall and sung them themselves. It wasn't sort of done. You picked up a song from an American hit and covered it very much like what we did at the beginning and the Beatles and everyone else. But you didn't actually write the songs and then they came out and they were hits. They were always done by someone else. So, so oh, I see. Well, they, oh, I see. You write your own. Well, just the concept of it was original. And, um, you know, you used to sit down and work out how they'd been, how, and Keith, I always remember analysing how they were constructed, so they were deconstructed by Keith. And uh, you see how it worked. I think um, Mick and Keith's strength in their writing relationship is the most important thing about the band, apart from Charlie's drumming. Um, you can't have either of those things missing, um, Mick and Keith's songwriting partnership and Charlie's drums and call the band The Stones, you know, you must have those things going and that's what we still have today. And I'm very relieved that their songwriting partnership is getting stronger. I mean, I didn't have any doubts, but 
Now I'm very happy that it's, it's even stronger than it's ever been. Where songs come from, I have no idea. They just zoom through the room, you know. I mean, I, I've never sat down in my life saying, I'm now going to write a song. You know, they come to me. I just sit around and play guitar, you know. I'll, I'll sing Buddy Holly stuff for Eddie Cotton or Otis Redding, you know. And, and after about half an hour, I think, yeah. incoming and the whole thing changes. And suddenly I have a song, you know. It's not anything to do with what I've been playing before, but there's a certain warm-up period. And it's like a transmitter. You know, you, I, or an antenna, really. You just put your hand up, and you're there, and you just see what's around. I've no, I've never had a problem with creating. I don't like the idea of even thinking there anything. I just pick them up. You know, they're there already, as far as I'm concerned. And that way, you get rid of that whole idea of like, I've got writer's block. And Mick and Keith were helping me on "I Can Feel the Fire." This one song I was doing down there. And at the same time, they were shaping up this song called It's Only Rock and Roll. It was a demo at the time, yeah, some dub, you know, that was just laid down, I think, Mick and Bowie, I think, at the time. Kenny Jones, I'm trying to, I've ended up using that track, you know, we just overdubbed it, I just kept layering it because it was the best feel there was, you know. Yeah, it's only rock and roll. Right? Mick Taylor had suddenly, you know, quite uh, astonished us by like, just pulling out bang like that. And it was towards the, you know, the middle of the black and blue sessions that Ronnie, who I'd already worked with uh, on his own first solo album, and they were firm friends, but he was with the Faces, and it was like, it'd be nice to have Ronnie, but you know, that's another gig, you know, it's ships that pass in the night. He's Faces, we're Stones, and. And suddenly, in the middle of those sessions, boom, the faces disintegrated. And he left Rudd, and uh, suddenly he was available. And when he walked into the studio and played for the one night, uh, at that time, it was all, everybody just looked around and said, it's him. I mean, he wasn't very serious. No, he still isn't very really serious about things, which is kind of maybe good or not. It was like a, a good, vibe um compared to we would talk you know other guitarists that we play with we were kind of serious and weren't really in the mood of the, of the whole thing the stones have a wonderful humorous camaraderie you know everyone in their own different ways charlie is very dry and mick is very elusive and keith is very max miller and uh i'm very Derek and Clive, you know, <laughs> we have a lot of humour between us. I don't want to live in a, in a world where you're just cut off from from major trends. It doesn't mean so you have to follow them, but it's, it's good to know what's going on because um, it's popular music. It's what it is. You're not like living in an ivory tower, and you don't have to be enslaved by trends. And every time it kind of comes along, you have to jump on it. But every now and then, something might come along that's kind of interesting, <clears throat> and you you can sympathize with it so think oh well, it's punks very fast okay good i right, see that you know <laughs> let's have a go at that i don't just i don't try and make hit records you know i mean i just try and make good ones you know and i put it out this is what i do this is the stuff you know and and you just you always keep your fingers crossed you don't know if, you know if it's going to hit the mood of the moment or you're going to be a boring old fart, or you're going to be like, wow, these cats can play. The thing about the band is pretty eclectic, and it always has been. It started off really as a blues band, and we used to be very pure, pure blues purists. We had a blues purist phase, and a little, little bit of Chuck Berry, that was as far as we got, and all the other rock and roll things we used to want to do were sort of like shelved and so on. Charlie and I particularly always liked dance crews as opposed to shuffles and eights. The, rock and roll on one hand and blues on another. It's just nice to get away from playing everything in shuffles and eights. And I was really pleased when you, when you felt that in the mainstream music you could play other grooves. Cover on mine just more or less wrote it and presented it and said, well, this is how it goes. And the, the difference on that was the way it was mixed because it was just very different from where, the way we originally did it and I think, I can't remember, I think it was Chris Kimsey that mixed it and we made a sort of 12 inch mix of it, which eventually became the single. So we threw out the single mix because the 12 inch sounded so much better. Undercover one was was to do with South America and dictatorships and people were disappearing 
very fast and and so the video of the song was around that was around that song was was to do with it and um people got very out, hot under the collar about that it's funny and then you find that you would you would expect that this medium or all these brash bands would have more of a go at this area and I'm, the stones don't do it very often i i freely admit but every time we do it's like Whoa. Is there, am I missing something or is there not a lot of that going about? Ronnie and I, ancient form of weaving, we call it. <laughs> There's something between Ronnie and me. Yeah, he's a very sympathetic player. Sometimes he gets carried away and slapping, but uh, that's another story too. <laughs> Most, you know, we, we, yeah, he, he's very good ear for what's being played and where to come in and, you know, and he'll pick up where I drop out. You know, you, I, I like guitar players that can play with you. But you can't really tell who's doing what. It doesn't really matter either. It's like lead guitar, rhythm guitar, and separated and so it's obvious. I, look, I like bands and I like guitars to play together where you forget about all that. And when we listen to something back, we go, wow, you know, is that you or me? You know, I mean, they say it was me. I say, no, it wasn't, it was me. You know? And the truth is that sometimes we blend in so much that we're not quite sure who plays what. Except that all the mistakes are Keith, you know, it's obvious, really. I never make any mistakes. A band, after especially been around together as long as we have, this goes beyond explanation. I mean, it's, I mean, it's a, the closest analogy is family, I guess, but maybe it goes even beyond that because families split up and kids leave. And, but we work together as well and play together. And it's a very special relationship between you know, between guys, you know. I and mean? sometimes we're very cold-blooded with each other, but you can do that with guys that know you. I think there's a lot of fr friendship has to be in it, in the equation. The trouble is with friendship that it that it's very volatile and fragile. And so that if you just have a professional relationship with people, you don't have any of that those problems. You know, if you if you just just have a professional relationship, and then you might think it's easier, or in some ways I guess it is. But then you, the friendship can cement a, a long, more long running thing. So you know, Keith and I have a friendship that goes back before the band. Then I have a friendship with Charlie and so on, and Ronnie. Um, and so that's one part of the glue, and then the other glue is do you enjoy what you're doing and the other thing is is it successful and so with if it is successful in the Rolling Stones they've had a lot of ups and downs over the years have been pretty successful what they do and people have liked it and so on so with all those things together that's the reasons some of the reasons that the, the bands continue I think to me the Stones right now are very is one of the most interesting points of the, of the whole deal, you know. Uh, we're the only ones still doing it. I've got the best band in the goddamn world, man, you know. What we're trying to do is just keep getting better and just deliver a honest rock and roll, which, you know, is an endangered species uh, these days because none of the animals that play it have lasted um, more than... 10, 12, you know, 20 years. We're finding out what it's like to do it through your whole goddamn life. And that's another thing, you know, and we're the only ones that can do that because everybody will split and die or gone, you know, but we're still here. I'm going to push it down the line. On a good day, it's a very, very good rock band. On a bad day, it's terrible, but you can say that about everyone.